Hey everyone, welcome back to the Zendek Project. If you're new to this series, this is a handheld gaming PC I've designed from the ground up that's powered by a modern AMD mini PC to give me the best DIY handheld gaming experience possible. Since the last video, I've been hard at work getting the next revision of the power management ready, so let's have a look at the changes. The first improvement I needed to make was to the self-discharge. Now that I've had a few weeks to test the first revision of the power management, I've been able to measure it at about 0.6% every hour, which means it can flatten a fully charged battery all on its own in about four days. I'm pretty sure I could improve on that if I could get the Arduino to sleep and wake properly, but I realized that I don't actually need the microcontroller to be powered on at all when the system is shut down, since the battery charger and fuel gauge ICs both store their settings as long as they stay powered. So, the microcontroller really only needs to be there for communication with the PC. So, I've removed the 5 volt regulator and I'm going to rely on the computer's USB to power up the microcontroller. So now, when you hit the power button, you are directly enabling the boost converter, which in turn, powers up the computer and the USB ports. The microcontroller then simply keeps the enable pin of the boost converter held high until the system shuts down or until the power button is held for 10 seconds, triggering a hard power off. In the previous video, I mentioned that I'd messed up and left out the resistors for setting the USB-C current and voltage requested for the charger, so that was the next change I needed to make. I included spots for the resistors on the new version of the board, but during assembly, I realized that I've actually been looking at the wrong data sheet for this IC the whole time. The documentation on some of these Chinese ICs can be a bit sketchy, and it looks like I've been using the data sheet for the HUSB 238A this whole time, but I've used the non-A version of the chip in the design. The two chips are almost identical, but the resistor values required to set the current and voltage are different, which means that to request the 20 volts and 3 amps that I need, I have to leave both of those pins floating after all. After all that, by nothing more than a fluke, the NUC deck power management is actually correct after all, as is the original version of this power management system. So why didn't it work properly? I can only assume it's a soldering issue on the original PCB as I haven't changed the design apart from adding the two blank spots for the resistors. I've had to scavenge a part or two that I forgot to order to get the next revision working so I can't easily go back to the old revision now and investigate. There were only two other issues I needed to solve from the original version of the board. The boost converter output remaining powered went off and the missing capacitors. I added a MOSFET to the output of the boost converter to solve the first issue. It was a pretty easy fix and with a bit of extra room due to the removal of the 5 volt regulator, I was able to shuffle the boost converter layout to make it a bit nicer at the same time. I wish I could say the extra capacitors worked as easily as the MOSFET did. I don't want to bore you too much with the details, but it turns out the capacitors I missed from the first design need to be polarized. I didn't realize this at the time, even though I had installed polarized capacitors on the previous version to fix the problem. I thought it was the extra capacitance that was needed and the larger electrolytic caps were the only ones I could get locally on short notice. So it was just a fluke that I managed to solve the problem on the last revision. Luckily, there is a nice spot on this revision of the board where I've been able to tuck a single 100 UF 25 volt capacitor. But obviously, I'll need to include this in the design properly if there's another revision. There's only one other problem I've found, and it's a simple one. When I shuffled the boost converter around, I swapped the order of the output pads so they worked better with the new layout, but I failed to notice that I hadn't updated the silk screen to match, so the labeling on my output is reversed. Obviously, it's not an issue that's gonna stop me from using the board, but it does open the door for a possible costly mistake in the future, so I really hope it doesn't come back to bite me. Before we fit this up, we need to thank this project sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay have kindly provided most of the parts and all of the PCBs for this project, and I simply couldn't have done it without them. If you need any PCBs, 3D printing, or machining done, make sure you show them some love and check them out in the link in the video description. I had a funny comment on the last video from Jonna494, who feels this console isn't actually real because he hasn't seen a video showing the full build process. Don't get me wrong, I'm not upset about his comment because you absolutely shouldn't believe everything you see on the internet, but I can promise you this console is very real. It's difficult to show the whole build process when it's taken about 10 months to get to this point, but I am planning to do a video showcasing the whole build once the project is complete. For now, here's a look at the inside while I fit up the new revision of the power management. It's getting pretty tight in here now with the batteries installed and it's even bending my PETG PC supports, so I may have to do something about that for the final build too. The SLA printed housing has held up well, but it's definitely a tad smaller than it's supposed to be, so I will have to sort out a replacement for it soon too. I'm trying not to remove any of the ports from this PC so that if I choose to upgrade the system in the future, I can hopefully put this thing back in its box and repurpose it as a mini PC. Now that the output power turns off properly, I can connect the power management directly to the PC. 
I've just soldered some 20 gauge silicon wires straight onto the points I found right behind the power input. I might add a connector to this in the future to make it easier to remove the PC, but for now, this will do. With everything back in place, I can carefully bolt the back cover on and fire this thing up. Even with the few problems the previous power management had, I've been having a great time playing through some of my childhood favourites on this thing over the last couple of weeks. Most of my testing so far has been at a lower power setting, so I can gauge what sort of battery life you can expect at lower TDP caps, as that is how I will be using it most of the time. I've found that a 7 watt TDP cap is ample for emulating most Wii and PS2 titles that I tested, along with playing games like Dirt 3 and Need for Speed Most Wanted, which I've actually almost completed the storyline playing on this device over the last few weeks. I get about 3.5 to 4 hours out of the system with the TDP capped at 7 watts, which is more than enough to get me through a week of gaming on my lunch break at work. Everything less demanding to emulate can be done at the minimum 5 watt TDP cap and will run beautifully as long as Windows doesn't decide to try and do something in the background while you're playing. For example, here's Crash Bandicoot 3 running happily on 5 watts using DuckStation with the texture mapping patch, running at 3 times the native resolution. The list of older PC titles that run perfectly at 5 watts is immense too. There's heaps of stuff that can be played with a minimum TDP cap and about 4 hours of battery life. I haven't done too much testing at the other end of the TDP scale yet, but now that the second revision of the power management is in and working, I will try some more demanding games over the coming weeks to ensure it's up to the task. I'll also keep an eye on the self-discharge to see how much it's improved. Based on my calculations using the standby power reported in the data sheets for the charger and fuel gauge ICs, we could potentially see a few years of storage without a charge. If that's the case, I won't easily be able to measure it in any meaningful way, but if I can get through a week of storage without losing a percent, I'm going to call that a win. Since the last video, I've had another couple of contributions on Buy Me A Coffee, so thank you to Matt and Afendi. Your support helps me buy the parts I need to keep these projects moving. I'd also like to say a big thank you to all of you guys. My channel's growing ever closer to reaching 10,000 subscribers, which is a milestone I wasn't even sure I'd make it to. I've just had some plastic delivered, so I'm ready to dive in and machine the final version of this housing, so I'll see you all in the next one.